If you're new to PA tuning or you're just not totally happy with how your PA tuning is going, I totally get you. It takes a lot of time and experience and trial and error to get really good at PA tuning. But recently I read a book called Between the Lines by a guy called Michael Lawrence. It says concepts in sound system design and alignment. And I learned a whole bunch from it. So here's just five of the many unexpected things that I picked up while I was reading this book. If you're new to PA tuning, you need a good grasp of EQ. So check out my free EQ guide at offshoreaudio.no forward slash EQ. Let's dive in. The first thing that I didn't expect is that calibrating your mic doesn't really make a difference. So you're tuning a PA system and you're going to need a measurement mic, right? You want it to be a really nice microphone with a flat frequency response across every single frequency, right? And we all know that it's impossible to get a completely flat frequency response. So what we want instead is we want a calibration file that dictates every single deviation from flat for every single frequency. That way we can load that into our software analyzer like Smart or Open Sound Meter. The software will know how to make our microphone curve flat, won't it? And so you think because we are undertaking a precision task of tuning the sound system that we need a completely flat microphone, but it's actually not the case. Most of the measurement microphones that you buy, including the one that I have, the Sonarworks ID reference microphone, are really, really flat. And if they have deviations, it's usually up really high in the high frequencies or really low in the low frequencies. So I get you, you're looking at this graph and you're thinking, well, then I can't count on this microphone to accurately measure things in these areas where it's not precisely flat. But sound is constantly interacting with its environment, right? It's constantly bouncing off of the floor, bouncing off of the ceiling, bouncing off of the walls. Multiple sound sources are combining when this happens. When you measure at one point in space and you're worried about this little high frequency problem that you're finding on your microphone. If you move that microphone just half a meter to the left, the equivalent of a person in the audience moving to the side, right? So one listener to another listener. The difference caused by changing the listening position is so much larger than the difference caused by having an uncalibrated microphone. So you really don't need an expensive microphone that's been meticulously calculated to make great EQ and timing decisions with PA tuning software. Now there are some benefits to more expensive microphones and microphones with calibration files. If you get that calibration file, then you know at least that the manufacturer has tested that microphone to ensure that it is within their tolerances. You know that it doesn't have any huge deviations and that it should function as expected. So it's a sort of quality control. And the second one here is the build quality. If you're using a really cheap microphone, it's gonna break and you're gonna have to buy it multiple times again. But the takeaway here is that if you're just getting started Started, just buy a cheap microphone. The one I got was like $90 and it really, really helps with learning system tuning. When you're a beginner, you want a microphone you're not afraid of losing, you're not afraid of knocking over and breaking. So get a cheap one to start with. And if you're taking your system tuning more seriously and you're doing it regularly for work, invest in something a little more expensive like $250 or $300. My second controversial takeaway from this book is that sub alignment is borderline pointless, right? We all love obsessing over subwoofer alignment don't we? We love the idea of getting smart and learning how to use smart in a measurement microphone so that we can line up our subs and our mains so that they merge together properly and give us a great rich sound. We think that time aligning our subs to our mains is going to solve all of our problems in the rooms that we're working in, don't we? Most of the time, our subs are on the ground, right? Our mains are in the air, whether they're on a pole or whether they are hung from the ceiling somewhere. There is a big distance between our main PA system and our subwoofer system. That means the sounds we're trying to line up are already displaced from each other. They will only align at one point on the floor where people are listening. If you pick a point in the listening area and you time align the mains and the sub to be in time there, you can take one step backwards, like one meter, and you will be out of timing again because you have moved a different distance from the sub than you have moved from the mains, right? Because if you're on the floor, you are closer to the subs than you are to the mains. So the reality is that when our subs and our mains are decoupled from each other in a different physical location, we can only align them at one point. 
So the only way to actually ensure that your subs and your mains are really time aligned throughout the whole space is by flying them both right next to each other so that most spaces in the room are the same distance from both speakers at all times. But it's not as big a deal as you think it is. We think this alignment is going to give us a really tight sound, but actually in the book, Lawrence tells us that most of the kind of untight sub sound that we hear is a result of wishy-washy reflections coming from all of the different surfaces in the room. Reflecting off the back wall, reflecting off the side wall. The biggest thing that you can do to get a tighter low end in your room is to use cardioid sub arrays to reduce the energy that's playing into the back wall. So use less time time aligning your subs and more time designing a better system that spills less energy into the back of the room and more energy into the front of the room. So the third really interesting thing that I learned just from reading this book was how cardioid sub arrays work. How we reduce energy from behind the sub and increase the energy going out in front of the sub. Subwoofers are inherently omnidirectional, right? Because of low frequencies, the size of the wavelength, you can't really control what goes forward and what goes back. So where you point the subwoofer doesn't actually make that much of a difference to where it goes. We can steer where high frequencies go using design of speaker horns and things like that. The way that we steer low frequencies is that we use phase cancellation to reduce the low frequencies in a certain direction from our speaker. By placing just two subwoofers in a line and choosing the distance between them, we can set them up to cancel each other out in one direction and reinforce the sound in the other direction. That sounds great, doesn't it? How do we do it? First of all, we need to pick a frequency where we want that cancellation to be most effective, right? And so for this example, I'm gonna choose 57 hertz, right? Why have I chosen 57 hertz? Because the wavelength is six meters. To create that cancellation, we need to space these subwoofers apart by a quarter wavelength. One quarter of six meters is 1.5 meters. So let's break this down really, really simply. Okay, so we start by like creating this physical space between these two speakers, right? And that space is a quarter wavelength, right? Which was 1.5 meters at our example of 57 hertz. What that does, right, is it creates a 90 degree offset in the waveform, right? So this space between these two elements shifts the relationship 90 degrees. So now we've got this kind of relationship between the two waveforms. Then we apply delay, right? Because normally we would hear this speaker first, wouldn't we? Right? And this one would come second and we would get this relationship. But if we delay this speaker by the quarter wavelength, right? We delay it so that these two line up again and we hear both the speakers at the same time. So essentially what we're doing is we're moving this here in terms of how we experience it, right? Here you see this delay here shifts the imaging of this speaker back to line up with this speaker, which results in two waveforms which line up on top of each other. We go back to a zero degree offset. We are here. And so we are happy. If we look at it from behind, right? If you were sitting on the other side over here, then you would hear this speaker first, wouldn't you? And this speaker would be behind it. Since we are delaying this speaker even further, we're not just getting a 90 degree shift, we are shifting it all the way over to 180, right? If you are behind the stage, you now experience the other speaker as being shifted even further away. And we create this 180 degree phase offset. So you see here, these two waveforms are like completely out of sync. And so we can extend that back the way, right? If we do this, then you see that they are completely 180 degrees out of phase and the rear of the stage while they are in the front of the stage experienced like this and they are completely in phase with each other. And we can obviously pick the frequency that we want to have cancellation at. It could be 60 hertz or 50 hertz. You can find calculators for these online. Fourth lesson I have to share with you is that size matters, right? This was a really cool lesson. The longer a line array system is, so the more elements that there are in a line array system, the more directivity we get in the low frequencies created from that line array system. So line array speakers are typically really, really narrow, right? You might get 120 degrees of coverage in the sort of horizontal spectrum, but only like 10 to 15 degrees in the vertical spectrum. And that's the design, right? Is that we point the different elements at different parts of the room, and then we have lots of individual control and we can reduce any differences between the front and the back of the room. 
But this is actually only in the high frequency elements of the speakers, only in the horns, the tweeters. Because just like with subs, low frequencies coming from a line array system are nearly omnidirectional, right? The lower you go, the more omnidirectional it gets. So actually the result is that when you're sitting out in the audience area, you might only be hearing like one or two of the boxes in that line array in the high frequency spectrum. But actually you're hearing the combined low frequency content of the entire line array. But what's cool, right, is that much like the cancellation with the subs, if you stand underneath the line array, right, you might not be hearing any of the top boxes, right? So maybe that's the intention. You're in an area where there shouldn't be any coverage with the line array. So you're not hearing the high frequency, but you're still hearing that omnidirectional low frequency. However, the time delay between the top speaker on the line array and the bottom speaker on the line array, so that's this natural time delay just caused by the distance between these two speakers, creates a cancellation in the low frequencies. So you actually get a sort of figure of eight pattern coming out of the line array. So you have less low energy going down and up from the line array. So basically, the longer the line array, the more directional it is. When you're tuning line arrays, it's also really good to be aware of all of this when you're thinking about EQ. Because when you stand at the back of the venue, you only hear two boxes in the high frequencies, but all the boxes in the mid frequencies, it stands to reason then that you can't individually EQ each zone in the low frequencies. So if there's too much bass, you have to substitute by increasing the high frequencies. You can't just cut the low frequencies in that one zone because you're listening to the entire line array not just the elements that you're standing in front of. If you're adjusting high frequencies, you can do that on a box to box basis. But if you're adjusting low frequencies, then you need to do it across the entire array system. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, the fifth and final tip is a really great point of contention, right? And it is subs on auxes or subs on a mono send or subs on any kind of separate fader that the mix engineer then has control of. Some people love it, right? They're like, oh yeah, need to be able to steer the subs up and down during the set to do what mix engineers do, you know? And then other people are like, no, you cannot change the sub configuration once the system has been deployed. So let me explain why they don't like this, right? The belief is that you need to time align your mains and your subs to get the greatest coherence, the greatest summation in frequencies at the crossover region, right? The acoustical crossover region, the place where the subs and the tops are as loud as each other in that particular frequency area. And the point is that if you time align all that perfectly, then change the volume of the subs. What you do is you actually shift the crossover region. So if you change the gain of the subs, the crossover region has changed. Ah, but in the book, Michael Lawrence suggests that if you change the gain by something like six decibels, then you're actually only shifting the crossover region by something like 10 to 15 hertz, right? And actually, chances are that if you were time aligned before you shifted the crossover, 10 or 15 hertz in one direction, you're probably still time aligned. And also, you're only aligned where you aligned those speakers. So if you don't like the sub, just move seat and you'll get a better sub response. So the lesson here is that if you do change the volume, it will change the crossover, but probably not enough that you should care about it. I'd really recommend the book Between the Lines. It's super easy reading compared to something like Bob McCarthy's book, and it really gives you a great overview of the thinking that goes behind setting up and tuning these sound systems. If you want to learn more about tuning system, if you want to learn more about tuning sound systems, I'll leave a video up here. Please leave me a comment if you tune sound systems and you disagree with me, or if you think it's great advice and you loved. Subscribe to the channel and like the video if it was useful, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.